<laughs> what do you think about sleep training? I know it's it could be controversial, but what do you think about it and what is it exactly? I mean, I definitely say that I am a sleep trainer. Right. Because, but I feel like the, the term has just gotten a bad rap right. because it's it become synonymous with, with what people think of as cry it out, mm-hmm. which is like you take your helpless, you know, four month old baby and you put them in the crib and you right. don't go back in until the morning and they're, you know, screaming for 12 hours. And yeah. I feel like that's what people think is sleep training, which couldn't be farther from the truth. So I like to say, you know, I, I talk about solo sleeping, sleep independence, because that's really what it is. But the goal of all sleep training is getting your kid comfortable falling asleep by themselves, which that's all it is, as it's the, the simplest term is. And that is really the key to create good sleeping habits. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And kids can do that as young as four or five months old. But it's, you know, quite often it's parents that end up kind of helping them more than the kids need help. Right. And then that just sticks (laughs) for a long, long, long time sometimes. Forever. (laughs) Forever. What's the the most creative excuse that you've heard for a child not wanting to go to bed? Because I get a lot of, where's Mm. daddy? I want to go see daddy. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Gosh. Which isn't that creative? It's just like, oh, I'm every thirsty. Every excuse possible. Every right. excuse every possible. excuse possible. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of fears that are really creative. Mm. You know, fears is something that parents really have to use their intuition, whether it's like a real fear or not. But it, you know, it could be all kinds of crazy things that kids come up with. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of potty excuses. You know, yeah. I have to go. I mean really how many times can a kid go potty? I mean, a lot of times is the answer. And they can always like squeeze out one drop of pee, which is enough to make you feel so guilty. Like, oh my God, I do have to pee for the 18th time. (laughs) When is it too late to start sleep training if that's even possible? Never, never. And I'll tell you why, because being able to fall asleep is so important. I mean, it's a life skill. It's a life skill. So, you know, I've worked with families who have 10 year olds who um, are, have gotten used to co-sleeping and are still co-sleeping and parents are, are thinking, you know, how do we get them? Cause now they're invited to summer parties or want to go to summer camp, but don't have the skills to sleep by themselves. So it's never too late. What's the difference between sleep training or, you know, coaching a family with a 10 year old versus a two and a half or three year old? Is it, do you find it easier or harder or is it just different challenges? It's just different. It's just different with like, you've probably seen with your kids in different ages. It's like Mm -hmm. same kid, just different, you Mm -hmm. know, the incentives that you might use with a 10 year old or the issues a 10 year old might be dealing with are different. There could Mm -hmm. be a lot more screen time usage, or you might be starting to see some hormonal changes where they're naturally staying up later. Mm -hmm. So there could be some schedule issues going on, school anxiety, things like that with a 10 year old that you're not going to necessarily see in like a three year old. Right. Okay, so Jessica Burke came to save the day. (laughs) We are so happy to have you here with us today. You are a certified toddler sleep coach. What does that mean? That means that I know all things about toddler and preschooler sleep issues and how to get, how to help parents get their kids to want to go to bed. Okay, maybe not want to go to bed, but (laughs) willingly go to bed and actually stay there and sleep in their own bed through the night without waking up. That's a real thing? Like toddlers really do that? You know, it is. <laughs> it is a real thing. And it's so funny that you say it like that because I do feel like, I don't know, as when you first have kids, you know, you expect to not sleep when you have a baby. Right. And I just feel like that's kind of the message that the culture sends to us. Like, right. well, you're a mom, like you're never going to sleep again. You know, one day they'll go to college. So don't worry about it. You <laughs> <Right>. know, <laughs> But in between here and that's a long time, y'all. <laughs> we yes. need to be sleeping in between that time. So I do like to tell families like, yes, that is a reality. Like your kids should go to bed and be able to sleep through the night because, you know, sleep is, it's a need. It's like a real biological need. Our kids mm-hmm. need 10 to 12 hours of sleep every night. And I mean, obviously we do too. Oh, we do too. As moms, you know, we're always (laughs) willing to sacrifice ourselves. So I always like to paint the picture of the needs for the kid, you know? Okay, so what does it mean to be certified? Just so that we can give context on your background. 
Yeah. And this is a really important question, I think, in this day of, you know, just the internet and social oh, media yes. and like there's experts on everything, you know, right. out there. So it is important to know. And it's great for parents to be able to find resources and kind of free help and tips, but you need to know who you're listening to. So that's mm. really important. So um, I am certified through a group called the Family Sleep Institute, which is like the original kind of certifying body for sleep coaches. Wow. And I did this training about eight years ago. Wow. And we, I forget how many hours, it's a four month long intensive program. Whoa. And we did, we read all the books. We had to go back and read research papers. And I mean, just an intensive program. Um, and then we had a men mentorship program where we had to go get clients and, and um, people mentored us through our first few clients. So um, it was a very supportive, very intensive program. So with your services, we'll talk more in depth about it, but where can people get a hold of you and what services do you provide? Because like, I already feel like you're saving our life right now yeah. because this is really exciting. Can yeah. you tell us about it? Um, yeah. So the best place that people can find me is um, at my website, awesomelittlesleepers.com. Mm -hmm. And that's also my Instagram name, Awesome Little Sleepers. Um, the services that I offer to families, um, I primarily offer an online digital course and it's called Sleep Tight Without a Fight. <laughs> Ooh, I love, love it. Because isn't that what we all want? Yes. You know? Um, so for a long time, I worked with families one-on-one -on -one and which was great and very rewarding. But what happened was, um, I, you know, I work with older kids, primarily toddlers and preschoolers, which no other sleep coaches specialize in that age group. Oh, so most people are talking to you about baby sleep and newborn yes. sleep, which is very important as well. Of course. But no one's really talking about what happens once your kid is out of the crib and in their own bed Uh oh, and they're free. And yes. there are three, <laughs> they're like crazy. <laughs> so anyway, so I specialize in that age group and I found that working one-on-one -on -one with families, I was just getting booked up. I was having to turn people away mm -hmm. and that didn't feel good because I knew I could help them. So I created like a digital online program that people can go through um, on their own time late at night if they need to. Um, and then we have a, a place where people can ask questions and get support and stuff like that. That's that is so amazing. <gasps> okay, so let's get to it. Let's get to it. What are the top three reasons that toddlers cannot sleep through the night? Okay. In your experience. Yeah. So we have to start and think about kind of who we're dealing with here. So when I say toddler, I'm really talking about kids who are like two and a half, really all the way up to eight years old is who I, who I serve. Wow. Um, oh, so wow. when you're, when you're, I feel like most of my families are probably in the three, four, five year old range, kind of when you're in this toddler bed um, or in this big kid bed out of the crib. And you have to realize like who we're dealing with here. Like this child is at a stage of life where their, their whole purpose is to kind of push boundaries and figure out how they fit into this world. You know, that's how they're figuring things out. They're really striving for control because everything in their lives is told to them. We tell them, what to wear, where to go, when, what to eat, mm -hmm. all these things. And so they're really striving to find some way to have some control in their lives, right? Um, and they are very attached to their parents. And so we have this kind of strong personality. And what happens is, I think a lot of times parents don't realize that their kids, they need to really start to understand their kids are older and it's time to let your kids have an opinion and listen to your kids when they're talking about bedtime. Because when they're babies, you know, we just kind of put them in their crib. Right. We do what we need to do to get them to go to sleep. But once they're older, we can involve our kids more in the process. So what happens is a lot of times at bedtime, you get pushback from kids because right. they don't want to go to bed. Mm -hmm. Kids have FOMO, mm -hmm. you know, <laughs> kids know that you're awake and they want to stay up with you. So you've got this severe case of FOMO. We've got this really, this kid who's trying to be independent, trying to push the boundaries. And then parents are there thinking, okay, like, we just read three books. We'll read another one, you know, and the kids are you know, asking for more things and parents are thinking, okay, well, maybe this is the last time. Maybe this is the last potty break, you know, or kids right. are running out of the room or kids are begging, stay with me, stay with me, lay in my bed, lay in my bed. And then parents just end up giving in because it feels easier in the moment. Yes. Mm -hmm. And not to like blame parents because we all know that it's important that our kids go to sleep. Mm -hmm we're tired, we're like willing to do whatever, you know? <laughs> and so, so unfortunately, that kind of willingness to do whatever it takes kind of end up backfiring mm. because then kids start to expect that that's how it's gonna go. Mm. 
Mm-hmm. When they ask for the one more book, you're going to give it to them. When they keep running out of their room and asking for things, you're going to give it to them. When they're begging you to stay, you're going to give it to them. Oh, man. So that's what ends up causing a lot of the sleep problems is that parents end up over inserting themselves into their kid's sleep process. That's like really the heart. Oh, my goodness. I don't know if that's what you thought I was going to say. No, I mean, it totally (laughs) makes sense. So what do you do in that point when you are transitioning out of a crib into a toddler bed? What what are the best practices when we do that? Yeah, so the best thing that I say to parents is, first of all, don't hurry to put your kid into a bed. Mm. I think a lot of times, you know, people look at their kid, they're getting older, maybe they started preschool, you know, they're two or or maybe there's a new baby coming and you need the crib. Mm -hmm. And so parents are like, okay, time to put the kid in a bed when really there's no hurry. I say, wait till your kid is at least three years old. Wow, okay. Or, you know, in high school. (laughs) (laughs) As long as possible, keep them in the crib. Keep them in the crib. Um, And then really work to have your baby, when they're in the crib, start to develop those good sleep habits before you move them to a bed. Oh, okay, got it. Because once they're free and in a bed and have all this freedom everything's just going to get worse. (laughs) Really? What are good sleep habits? Yeah. So when I say good sleep habits, I mean kids who can, who can go to bed and fall asleep independently. So without needing help from a parent Mm -hmm. and then that will help them sleep through the night. So you really want a kid who is able, you're able to go through a bedtime routine and then you're able to, you know, put them in the crib and leave the room when they're still awake that's really what you want. I'm mm-hmm. looking at Katrina. <laughs> My, I've never had that happen. So I'm already behind, <laughs> but that's okay. No, you're not we'll behind yet because are you still in a crib? Uh, kind, we co-slept. Okay. Okay. So yeah. We're already behind. It's yeah, okay. Yeah. I know. I know we have an uphill battle, but it's okay because I'm ready to take all the advice <laughs> yes. from that's you my guess, yes. here. so that well, we can get to a good point. And you know, sometimes I feel like it's actually easier as kids get older, mm-hmm. because like I said, they are opinionated and they right. really want to be heard. Mm-hmm. And so when we as parents can learn how to kind of harness mm-hmm. that and like harness their desire for control and we can use it for good, right. <laughs> then it can actually make the process easier. Good. So then I have a question. So then when it is bedtime, let's say it's nine o'clock, 10 o'clock, like how do you get them to bed when they don't want to go to bed? Like you you talked about establishing routine. What if they don't even want to start the routine? Like, is it just, all right, we're going to kick and scream to the bathroom till you get to the tub and just keep going through it? Or is there some sort of compromise you start making for a few days? What do you suggest? Well, okay, so the first thing is timing. So right. that bedtime's a little bit later than what I typically recommend. Mm-hmm. So I... <laughs> Uh, can i say jessica my daughter last night she slept at midnight okay so we're being uh, honest when i'm saying we can use any kind of information and advice we will take it all because she's been sleeping at midnight she slept at midnight and i'll give you one little um (laughs) one little wrench to throw into the thing we just got back from california probably three weeks ago so Uh, her not only was her schedule messed up she was jet lagged yeah so trying to get her back let's have a little empathy yeah she doesn't normally sleep at midnight yeah that that definitely throws a wrench into things when does she normally sleep 10 10 p.m 10 p.m okay Okay, back to jessica i can get her at at nine or ten i've never gotten her at seven or eight unless we like one time we traveled east so, oh, so you're just letting time that was zone easy. work. <laughs> like, that was yeah. easier. You're like, it's oh, seven. God. I mean, you think it's 10, but yeah. it's seven here. Yeah, so. yeah, correct. Um, so, okay. One thing that will make it easier yeah. is going to bed earlier. Okay. Because kids, their bodies have kind of a natural rhythm. And if you can hit like the nail on the head in terms of timing, it'll be, actually be easier for her to fall asleep. Mm-hmm. And it's going to be somewhere in that seven to eight Ooh, time what? frame. <laughs> And a lot of times parents miss it though. A lot of times parents yeah. miss the be- miss this bedtime. So what you're saying is not like uncommon at all, but you were saying what's gonna make it easier. So the answer is trying to get the timing right because what happens is when you're when you're putting trying to put your kid to bed too late and they've already gotten like a second wind, that's just gonna make everything mm-hmm. more difficult. So then you're fighting an uphill battle, a kid who already has cortisol and adrenaline, Mm. And they're hyped up, man, you know? So then you're trying to bring them down and that's when you're getting so much resistance. So if you can get them to bed at the right time, that will that will help. That'll be like one step. 
And so looking for kind of those signs of sleepiness in that seven to eight time period is mm. important. And they could be subtle, like they could be subtle. So you might see, I call them like, the, like there's sleepy signs and then there's, there's hyper signs actually. So Ooh. sleepy signs are like, let's say your kid starts twirling their hair. That's what my daughters always did. They always mm. started twirling their hair. So really subtle. I'm not talking about yawning or eye rubbing, like common ones. I mean, like if they just kind of start to zone out, maybe they get a little fussy or maybe they're like laying their head down on the table at dinner or like their body seems heavy. Like those are subtle signs that they're tired. Mm -hmm. But another sign might be like, let's say your daughter gets super hyper at eight o'clock. <laughs> well, that's that second wind kicking in. Oh. So that means that bedtime should have been a little earlier. Oh, good to so know. So if you kind of look for those signs, getting the right time will help, but then also just getting in the routine of you know, putting her to bed at that same time, well, just her body will start to know instead of it being like nine or 10 or 11, it's, the, she will start to learn that at 7.30, that's when we go to bed. And then we do these certain steps in the routine very uniformly every night. Building that repetition helps to actually like help her body feel more tired, tired and go to sleep. That's great. So then when adjusting, like for example, jet lag, when we're adjusting, should we wake her up earlier so that she's tired at eight or still continue to let her sleep till nine, then around eight o'clock, try and bring her in, even though I know she's not sleepy yet? You know what I mean? Like, should we still go through the motions and spend more time in bed trying to get her down or? Yeah, well, I mean, you definitely have to give your whole schedule some grace when you guys are traveling like coast to coast. That's right. like a big time jump for sure. Mm -hmm. But ultimately, yeah, I mean, it, I think it takes people typically three or four days mm -hmm. to adjust to a new time zone. Mm -hmm. So I tell families like, if they're traveling somewhere and it's just for like a couple nights, just try to stay in the same time zone if you can. Right, makes sense. If it's sense. not too drastic. But if you're gone for a while, obviously you kind of need to transition. So you can just kind of slowly take it, take it back in 30 minute increments. Mm -hmm. But certainly waking her up earlier can help so that you can get that, that bedtime back on track. Oh gosh. I did want to ask about the hyper signs. What were some of the hyper signs? So it could really be anything. I mean, just if there's a time of the evening, and again, it's usually in that like seven to eight time mm -hmm. frame where your kid was like, maybe they were a little quieter, but then all of a sudden they're just like lapping around the house <laughs> and really going crazy, you mm -hmm. know, or a lot of times I hear about people who it's during um, bath time where their kid starts to get really hyper because sometimes we're yeah. trying to start the bath a little bit too late. And so then they get really hyper in the bath and it's hard to settle them down afterwards. So just the idea of just getting like a jolt of energy. What is sleep regression? And I've heard about sleep regression happening at different stages for, you know, babies and toddlers. Yeah. So what is it and how do we avoid it if we can? Okay. Well, this is, I, I'm going <laughs> to give you a somewhat controversial answer here. Okay. But sleep regressions aren't really a real thing. Really? I know. <gasps> So there's really not oh that much God. like scientific evidence to prove this concept of sleep regressions. Now, what you're talking about and what people typically see is when different, um, when kids like achieve different milestones, just in their normal like mm -hmm. brain maturation process, that can, that can disrupt sleep. But the reason why the, the concept of sleep regressions really isn't a real thing and why I don't like that term mm -hmm. is because I feel like it gives parent. It seems like real sciency, right? And it's like, well, this is why this is happening. It's a sleep regression, and oh well, right? Nothing I can probably do about it. It's right. like a sciency thing going on with my kid, but that's not really true. So certainly, there are times when your kid is, you know, learning how to walk or learning how to stand up, or there's different times where kids are going through milestones and learning things, and it can disrupt sleep. But it's not something that the way I hear people talk about it, it's like, oh, we've been in the sleep regression for six months. And you're like, no, yeah. <laughs> it'll be a couple days of a blip. Right. But parents can do things to help that from spiraling out of control, you know? Mm -hmm. So I think a lot of times it's kind of used as an excuse. Got it. But that totally makes sense how you just explained that. Yeah. So what are some things we can do when they are going through that patch of uneasy <laughs> sleep? <laughs> what do we do? <laughs> well, the best thing to do is have good sleep habits when they're not going through that, which is most mm -hmm. of the time. So when I say good sleep habits, I mean like a well-established, you know, bedtime that your kid can get used to and a good bedtime routine, right? Mm -hmm. So 
these are the five or six things that we do before bed. And it takes, you know, 15, 20 minutes. And kids kind of get used to that. So when you have that system set up and it's um, it's very routine, kids get used to that. And then those sleep disruptions can pass more quickly. Oh. So it's really working on like, you know, Yes. Certainly like things will be different. Like let's say if your kid is sick or, you know, vomiting all night, things are going to be different, but that doesn't last forever. That's a few days when we get back on track. So it's the idea of having a back on track to get to. (laughs) Totally makes sense. Does diet impact how toddlers sleep? Yeah, I'm. I, yes, I'm sure that it can. I'm right. really not like a dietitian sure. expert in that way, but um, but yes, yeah, certainly. I mean, it's important that kids are you know well fed right. before they go to bed. A lot of times, I hear families saying that kids are waking up because they want milk or they're hungry, and you know, once kids are are over about five or six months old they have the capacity, or even four or five months old, they have the capacity to sleep through the night. Yeah. They do. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying most of them may not at that Mm -hmm. age, Mm -hmm. but they have the capacity to, meaning, and as they age, certainly into the the age that I deal with, like, you know, two, three, four, five-year-olds, they they shouldn't have a need to eat at all during the night. Just like they sleep like you or I would. We eat during the day and then we sleep at night. And right. we really, you know, at some point in that time period, we, it's our job as parents to break that connection mm-hmm. that we have between feeding and eating that happens when we have newborn babies. You know, it's at some point we have to say, okay, eating is for the daytime when we need to get calories and be awake. Mm-hmm. And then sleeping is for nighttime. And it's it's not, we don't eat to go to sleep. Right. <laughs> <laughs> we shouldn't as adults right. Right. Or, or toddlers. What do you do when your toddler starts waking up earlier and earlier and <laughs> earlier? Yep. That, what are we doing? That Help is, me out. That is a common problem. <sighs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> That's why I let Amara sleep till midnight because she'll sleep till nine. Just in case anyone's curious, we're like, all right, if the longer you, the later you sleep, I've heard that, but the longer I don't know if that works. See, I, I know don't know. Bad, but that, she, that doesn't always work though. Sometimes that. Sometimes for that still get up for us, it works. She still she gets up at nine, no earlier, maybe eight thirty. But if she's sleeping at eleven or, or twelve, it <laughs> well, sounds here's so the terrible. Thing, so, She'll sleep till then. Well, okay, so we want her to be getting like ten to twelve hours of uh-huh. sleep. So even though she's sleeping from twelve to nine, that's still, that's not, still enough. not enough. Yeah, you're right. <gasps> I mean, that's certainly we want everything to be earlier. Of like course, a, a great oh, man, a great yeah. schedule for her would be like seven thirty to six thirty. Oh. 6.30, okay. Okay, okay yeah, right. so but 11 hours of sleep. Okay, maybe eight. Okay. Okay, okay, I'll do it. I'll okay, do it. so I'll tell, you, I'll tell you about the early wake up. <laughs> yes. So typically why kids are waking up earlier and earlier is because they're going to bed too late, which seems counterintuitive, yes. right? It seems like it would be more like what you're saying, right. where the later they go to bed, the later they sleep. Really doesn't always work out that way. And it's because what happens is, like I said, when kids go to bed too late, they get this like rush of cortisol. It's like a stress hormone. And that actually, it makes it harder for kids to fall asleep, but it also like degrades the quality of their sleep and it can cause them to wake up in the middle of the night and then wake up at in the 5 a.m. hour. A lot of kids waking up in the 5 a.m. hour. Yes. And that's because they're going to bed too late. So really, you got to move bedtime earlier. And so is it moving it up 15 minutes, 30 minutes or... Does it well, all depend? It kind of, it depends on the age. It depends on if they're napping. But I mean, you know, for kids really under the age of six, we want them to be asleep by eight. How wow. long should their naps be in order to get them to sleep through the night? So, or does that have nothing to do with? No, life? it does. Okay. It does for sure. It, it, it factors in because sleep, it matters. Your whole 24 hours of sleep matters. So mm-hmm. most kids are napping until, I mean, I recommend that parents try to keep the nap until kids are you know, three, four years old. Mm -hmm. Some kids kind of drop it earlier. Um, But, and I recommend that as long as the kid is taking a nap and Mm -hmm. still able to be asleep at a reasonable time at night to encourage that napping, but sometimes it needs to be a little bit shorter. Sometimes Mm -hmm. if a kid's taking a monster two hour nap and Mm -hmm. they're four years old, Mm -hmm. they might struggle to go to sleep at eight. Mm -hmm. So then you cut the nap back to an hour. So it takes a little bit of trial and error. What are your tips for when they do start waking up in the middle of the night? Like what, what is your suggestion to get them to go back to this, to sleep and stay asleep so that you don't have to keep coming in there yeah. or not come in there? I don't know what the, 
Right. Okay. So it's a great question. And so the answer is we have to look at what's happening in the middle of the night. So your question is like a totally valid one. Like what do we do when they're waking up in the middle of the night? But the important thing to realize is that their sleep, it's it's their sleep and their behaviors, which is the wake ups, but it's also how you're, you as the parent are responding to that. Mm-hmm. So like, for example, let's back it up to bedtime. Like if your child is used to you falling asleep with them in their bed, or like, you know, maybe you, you lay with them for a few minutes, they fall asleep and then you sneak out, which is really common. Well, then everybody moves through different stages of sleep, right? Deep sleep and light sleep. So your child at some point in the middle of the night is going to move into a lighter stage of sleep and they're going to realize mm-hmm. that you're gone. And guess what? They don't know how to fall asleep without you because you've been laying with them for yeah. so, you know. So then they have to come find you to get that same situation, get you back in there so they can get back to sleep. Mm. So the best way to prevent your kid from waking up in the middle of the night is start with bedtime and work on them falling asleep independently at bedtime. That's like the key. So at two or three years old, let's say you've already been sleeping next to them or helping them go to sleep, what are your tips on how to break, break the that, cycle, break, break that habit the cycle. so that the baby or the toddler or two, three, four year old can now fall asleep on their own without me being there till midnight <laughs> with her? <laughs> I like how we went from how does someone to, Let's keep it real. I'm talking about me. <laughs> yes. We are doing one-on-one sleep coaching today. Yeah. <laughs> no, so, okay. So this is really what I help. This is exactly what I teach families how to do. So mm-hmm. I have designed what's called the REST method. And REST is an acronym. So R-E-S-T. And it stands for, it's the, it's the four pieces of awesome sleep. It's how to turn your kid into a great sleeper. So the letter R stands for the right sleep schedule, which we kind of touched mm-hmm. on. Um, E stands for excellent bedtime routine, which we also touched on because kids are creatures of habit, right? They having that, you know, well-defined bedtime routine is really important. S stands for solo sleep strategy. So Mm -hmm. that's exactly what you're asking about. Like how to, how do we get our kids to be solo sleepers? Mm -hmm. Meaning they don't need us with them to fall asleep. Um, and then T stands for tease a reward because I'd like to use rewards and praise to help jumpstart new new behaviors that might be different for kids. Mm -hmm. So when it comes to the letter S, solo sleep strategy, I really teach families how to work with their kids to develop a new bedtime routine that's fun. And really the parents have to come up with the plan that they're gonna be comfortable with to get their kids comfortable sleeping alone because there's, there's different ways to do it. I teach a few different ways inside of my course. You can do it quickly. You can do it very gradually where, um, you know, let's say if you're used to laying with your kid, you might start as, as simple as sitting instead of laying, you know, sitting oh, on the bed, interesting. sitting next to the bed. So it may be a process like that. And so with your older kids though, you can explain to them what's going to happen. Right. Why, why do we need to change things? You know, why do things need to change? What are we going to do? What is that going to look like? What is that going to feel like? You can role play it. So if you learn how to communicate with your kids, you can explain the plan to them. And that's going to go a long way to getting them to cooperate, Mm -hmm. especially if you, you know, give them a lot of choices and really speak to them in an age appropriate way that can, that can help to make things go more smoothly. That's great. But yeah, there, there's many different ways to do it. It kind of depends on the family, the sleep situation that you've been in, but with like a co-sleeping situation, um, like you guys have been doing, I recommend that families like just take it really slow and gradual. And, you know, the goal is to help build up your kids' confidence and independence, right? Because we want them to grow up to be self-reliant, confident, independent little people, but they're going to like, they're going to pick up on that from us too. So we've got to, we've got to do our good job of involving them, listening to them, hearing them, and then cheering them on. I know you can do this. I am so confident in mm, you, you know, mm-hmm. really building up, really building up their confidence is important. I love that. What do you think about playing music to help them go to sleep? What are your thoughts on that? Is it a distraction or does it help? Um, it's definitely personal preference. Um, so I, I recommend that people have like a white noise machine. Mm-hmm. A white noise um, mm-hmm. But if you like music, you could certainly have that but I would turn it off when it's actually time for the child to like close their eyes and go to sleep. 
because there is science that tells us that if there's anything going on in the room that has any kind of pattern, even if it's like like the creepy sound machines that have like the heartbeat or whatever, <laughs> like, <laughs> or, or even like the like the tide coming in and out where there's like a pattern, your brain will actually, or, or music, mm -hmm. your brain will actually like follow that instead of going into like a deep sleep. Wow. So that's why it's better to not have music on all night. Wow. That okay. That's helpful. That yeah. is We've helpful. done lullabies. We've done the um, white noise. So I, and I could tell the lullabies are counterintuitive sometimes for her. <laughs> yeah. But it's fine to do that. Like during the bedtime routine, mm -hmm. you know, or if you sing lullabies before yeah. bed, but yeah. then when you, when it's time for like lights out, close your eyes, white noise is the best option that you can leave on all night long mm -hmm. and it'll help like drown out, you know, house noises and stuff. Is there a goal on when to end using white noise? I um, personally got addicted to white noise when I had my kids and I had the monitor, you know? Right, yeah. <laughs> right. It's very soothing. It's very soothing. And now I still sleep with it. Like, no, you know, I've got the really? app on my phone. Yeah. How interesting. Do your kids still use it? My kids still use it. Yeah, okay. they're 11 and 13. Um, one of them likes it really loud in her room. She's got a fan on, like full blast. She likes it freezing and like, like loud with white noise type yeah. mm -hmm. things. Um, and then my other daughter likes it more quiet. So it's like really, really low, but it's still there. That is so yeah. interesting. Okay. So do you, so you sleep better with the white noise? I do. I do. But you know, I have a husband who snores. So uh, well, there's, there's then you definitely need the white noise. <laughs> <There's> <laughs> <What> that. <laughs> what do you think about sleep training? I know it's, it could be controversial, but what do you think about it? And what is it exactly? I mean, I definitely say that I am a sleep trainer. Right. Because, but I feel like the, the term has just gotten a bad rap right. because it's become synonymous with, with what people think of as cry it out, mm -hmm. which is like you take your helpless, you know, four month old baby and you put them in the crib and you right. don't go back in until the morning and they're, you know, screaming for 12 hours. And yeah. I feel like that's what people think is sleep training, which couldn't be farther from the truth. So I like to say, you know, I, I talk about solo sleeping, sleep independence, because that's really what it is. But the goal of all sleep training is getting your kid comfortable falling asleep by themselves, which that's all it is, as it's the, the simplest term is. And that is really the key to create good sleeping habits. A hundred percent, a hundred percent. And kids can do that as young as four or five months old. But it's, you know, quite often it's parents that end up kind of helping them more than the kids need help. Right. And then that just sticks <laughs> for a long, long, forever. long time sometimes. Forever. <laughs> forever. forever. What's, the, forever. Um, what's the most creative excuse that you've heard for a child not wanting to go to bed? Because I get a lot of, where's mm -hmm. daddy? I want to go see daddy. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Gosh. Which isn't that creative? It's just like, oh, I'm every thirsty. Every excuse possible. Every right. excuse every possible. excuse possible. I mean, there's a lot of a lot of fears that are really creative. Mm. You know, fears is something that parents really have to use their intuition, whether it's like a real fear or not. But it, you know, it could be all kinds of crazy things that kids come up with. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of potty excuses. You know, yeah. I have to go. I mean really how many times can a kid go potty? I right. mean, a lot of times is the answer. And they can always like squeeze out one drop of pee, which is enough to make you feel so guilty. Like, oh my God, I do have to pee for the 18th time. <laughs> when is it too late to start sleep training if that's even possible? Never, never. And I'll tell you why, because being able to fall asleep is so important. I mean, it's a Absolutely. life skill. It's a yes. life skill. So, you know, I've worked with families who have 10 year olds who um, are ha have gotten used to co-sleeping and are still co-sleeping. And parents are, are thinking, you know, how do we get them? Because now they're invited to slumber parties or want to go to summer camp, but don't have the skills to sleep by themselves. So it's never too late. What's the difference between sleep training or, you know, coaching a family with a 10 year old versus a two and a half or three year old? Is it, do you find it easier or harder or is it just different challenges? It's just different. It's just different with like, you've probably seen with your kids in different ages. It's like mm -hmm. same kid, just 
different, you Mm -hmm. know? The incentives that you might use with a 10-year-old or the issues a 10-year-old might be dealing with are different. There could Mm -hmm. be a lot more screen time usage or you might be starting to see some hormonal changes where they're naturally staying up later. Mm -hmm. So there could be some schedule issues going on, school anxiety, things like that with a 10-year-old that you're not gonna necessarily see in like a three-year-old. Right. I've heard many different opinions on getting your child tired before bed. Yeah. And also trying to calm them Mm -hmm. down. So do you think there's more, is it easier if they are running around before you start calming down before bedtime or just kind of letting them naturally play and do what they do? Because I've had parents go like, yep, we're going to run around and we're going to do this and we're going to have a pillow fight before we start bath. So we get it all out. Get it all out. Yeah. Yeah. I think that's great. I think it depends, um, you know, on the day that the child has had some kids who, if they Mm -hmm. go, let's say they go to preschool all Mm day. I mean, they've got those kids scheduled. They're having a good day. They're playing all day long with their friends. You know, they might come home and be pooped. Mm -hmm. So trying to have, get a bunch of activity might be too much for them. So I think just reading your kid is important. Mm -hmm. What would you say are some of the three mistakes that parents try to do when it comes to sleep training? They want to do it, but they don't know how to do it right. Yeah. Um, I would say a few things. I think giving in, a lot of times parents think, and I think I might have said this already, but like (laughs) when your child is asking for more things during the bedtime routine, like you're trying to be good, you're trying to say, you know, just two books or whatever it is, but your kid is like begging you for just one more page, Mm -hmm. one more book, whatever it is. And they'll give in because like, you know, oh, it's, you know, she's done such a good job these last couple of nights. We've been trying to work on Mm. sleep. And, but just that act of giving in is just an invitation for her to just keep asking for more things, you know? And so I think really understanding Mm -hmm. that what is important for kids is that structure, that routine and that sleep. And so not giving in, especially when you're trying to establish new habits, Mm -hmm. that's really important. And the other thing too is, um, I work with families a lot who are working, you know, to establish independent sleep with their kids. So from, you know, bedtime and overnight, trying really hard to get the parents out of the bed with the kids so that the kids can learn these skills on their own. But then if the kids are waking up, let's say the kid's waking up at six or 6.30, but the parents aren't quite ready to get up. So they let the kid come into bed with them for a little Mm. while in the morning. Well, what can happen with that, which seems lovely and nice, what's wrong with that? Nothing's wrong wrong with it. But what could happen is the child doesn't know when it's six in the morning and it's okay to get in bed. So then you start to see that creep earlier and earlier and earlier. Wow. Because the kid has no frame of reference. It's like, <gasps> well, when am I allowed in your bed and when am I not allowed? So it's got to be a consistent, you got to be consistent. Ooh. Yeah. So lack of consistency, I think, is the key. Is the that's that's where the challenges come in when when parents don't kind of stick with it. Wow, I didn't even think about that. Yeah, yeah. How the kids come in the morning, and, yeah. and like how that can completely throw off sleep training. Yeah, I love to snuggle with my kids. I mean, trust me, like we, I've yes, I mean they're all over me all the time. We're watching. I mean, <laughs> right. like they're thirteen and eleven, and it's still the truth. But we are always snuggled up. We're always on the couch watching movies. I mean, you can you can have that time. It just doesn't have to be associated with sleep if it's important to you that your kid is sleeping independently, which is of course a family's choice, obviously. That is that's a good gem right there. <laughs> okay, so what are some ways to calm a toddler, a child down? If they're having a breakdown, it's a meltdown right before it's sleep time. Right before bed and they're having a A meltdown, a nuclear meltdown. Yes. (laughs) Well, I think that the the rule of thumb is there's not too much you can do in the moment, (laughs) unfortunately. (laughs) Yeah. But there's tools that you can use before to, to prevent that from happening in the first place. But in the moment where it's happening, you just need to kind of let it run its course and try to not give it too much attention, Mm. if that makes sense. Yes. So our kids really thrive off of our attention, right? I mean, that's why they're always like, look at me. Okay, watch me. Okay, wait, no, watch me again. Like, let me show you this. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Because they, because when we're focused on them, it's important. And so it, it makes them feel powerful and good. And that's a great use of, of positive attention. But, you know, most of the time we are distracted. We're cooking dinner. We're looking at our phone. We're doing something else while, you know, while we're engaging in life. But then all of a sudden at bedtime, we're in this room with our child and all of a sudden our child is throwing a temper tantrum or whatever. And 
look how much focused attention we are giving to this child now. Maybe both parents are involved in trying to calm them down. Well, that really gives the whole, the whole situation a lot of energy and a lot yeah. of power. Mm -hmm. So you just have to be you know, cognizant of how much attention you're, you're giving to those kind of behaviors. Yeah, that totally makes sense. Yeah. To see that? Yeah. So then you think it's best to... Not ignore that. Not acknowledge that it's happening. <laughs> I would say, you know, give them some time to calm down. And then, but I, you can't, like, they're not logical and rational right. people to begin with because they're, they're not, their brains aren't developed that way. <laughs> but certainly in that moment, there's no talking <laughs> right. them out of it. Right. There's no negotiate, which, you know, we all do that as parents. Like, oh, okay, yeah. okay, 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 okay. I'll do this. Okay. Yeah. I'll do this because right. there's a lot of, if I can just prevent that from happening, yes. this will go so much, so much more smoothly. Like right. parents walking on eggshells, like, okay, time to brush your teeth. Oh, you don't want to brush them tonight? Okay, it's fine. It's fine. We'll skip it. We'll skip it. We'll skip it. Right. You know, just trying to avoid that meltdown. Mm -hmm. But your kid, your kid is just feeding on that power that you're giving them. <laughs> right. oh, man. They're like soaking in all the energy. I can yeah. like picture them going, ah, yes. get all to them. Yeah, they're trying right. to hold. Yeah, and I'm yes. like, yes. <laughs> I am in control. <laughs> so there are some ways that you can avoid that happening by giving them some control in like a re in a reasonable way. So what I teach families to do is like a cool exercise where um, you work with your kids to establish a good bedtime routine that your kid's actually gonna enjoy and hopefully not rebel against, or at least not as much. So you sit down with your kid, you have like a family meeting. So you're not on your phone, you're giving your kid focused attention and you're like, hey buddy, you know, bedtime has been taking a really long time. Sometimes you're crying, sometimes mommy's crying. You know? <laughs> this isn't fun for anybody. Like, let's make this fun. Like, I wish this was, I wish this was fun. I wish it was like cozy and felt like a fun time. Don't you think that? You know, and let your, you know, mm. engage your kids. So what do you want to do before bed that's fun? Like, we know we have to brush our teeth. That's kind of boring. We know we got to put our PJs on. You know, what do you want to do first? Do you want to put your PJs on or brush your teeth first? So even the act of giving them a choice of which thing comes first gives them a little bit of a sense of control. Mm -hmm. Maybe they say, you know, oh, I wanna tuck in my baby dolls. Okay, great, Let's then we tuck in your baby dolls. Then do you wanna read one book or two books? Two books, okay, we're gonna read two books. So you have them kind of like help you put things in order. And I like to write it down and draw like a little icon and actually have a little chart that you Ooh, can tape on the wall of their smart. room. I like it. So giving them that okay. control and then, anything that used to stall, right? Like, so if they're always asking for water or always asking for another potty break, like you bake that into the routine. Ooh. So you say, you know, you, you always come out of your room and ask for some more water. Should we go ahead and take our sip of water right before we turn the lights out? Okay, let's write that down. So you write it all down and have that chart in their room. Oh, I love that. That's great. Yeah. Yes. Me too. That so is that's so where the, good. That's where they can use their control. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so how do you know when you're helping families that their toddler needs to drop a nap, right? Because usually babies, they start off with two naps in a day. Mm -hmm. Yep. And then at some point they drop off one. So yep. what are some signs that you look for that you're like, okay, it's time to drop that second nap or whatever it is? Yeah, so normally you go down to one nap around like a year and a half old. Mm -hmm. um, so then you'll go down to one nap and then that will be in the middle of the day, starting anywhere between like 12 and one. Mm -hmm. um, and then they'll keep that until they drop it completely. So if, if you find that your child's having a hard time going to bed, you may wanna shorten the nap, but I wouldn't drop it all together until the kid is showing you a couple things. Number one, if you're putting them down for a nap, and they're just not sleeping. Like they're just hanging out, playing, but they're not actually going to sleep for like two weeks. That's a sign mm. that they might be done with the nap. Got it. But I actually like to start calling nap time quiet time around the time kids are like maybe two, just kind of rebranding it because it's really nice for families to still have that break in the middle of the day. Yes, yes. Even if like the kid isn't sleeping. Right. So, okay, time for quiet time. But if you see that they're not they're not sleeping for two weeks, you can kind of, you know, forget the idea of a nap. So just assume that they're not napping anymore. The other way is if you put them down for a nap and maybe they're falling asleep, but it's not till late. 
Like if they're not falling asleep until like two o'clock, well, that's too late. It's too late for them to be taking a nap. Oh, really? So you wouldn't just shift the nap to be at two or something? You're just like... No, because then it's going to be too close to when you want them to go to bed. So, got it. Because I want them to be awake like by three o'clock at the latest. Got so they it. can go down for bed still at a reasonable time. So if they're not falling asleep until, until two or so, then I'd say, let's just drop the nap. Uh, but when you do drop the nap, when the kids stop sleeping during the day, you might need to move bedtime even a little bit earlier right? because they are losing some of that sleep that their body was used to. And with naps ending at three, that is with the child on a schedule where the child is waking up at 6.30? Anywhere after 6 a.m. Mm -hmm. is like a biologically appropriate time for them to get up. Nice. Okay, cool. Yeah. Are there any hacks to speed up a nighttime routine? Yeah, for sure. You know, because sometimes I feel like kids are like, well, let's 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 walk slower. Let's move at <laughs> extra slow. Because they're trying to, oh my gosh. you know, enjoy the moments with you. How yeah. can we speed this up? Yeah, <laughs> because they're master <laughs> stallers. Oh yes. man, they are. Yes. they are. They are. But isn't it amazing though? Because yeah. I, I always say that by the time kids are like six months old, they totally like have our number. Oh like, yeah. Like, yeah. <laughs> they're like, so much smarter than us. Like they, they get it. And we're here exactly. trying to figure it out. Yep. Yeah. So, um, but it's just human nature, right? Like everybody learns how to get what they want. That's just human right, nature, right. right? So kids are like, yeah, the slow movers. <laughs> um, use timers. That's a great thing. If there's something that takes forever, like some kids like want to stay in the bath forever. You know, like it's a freaking spa day. Like we got to go. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> we have things to do. <laughs> So you can use a timer for a bath. Um, if you have the kids set the timer, that's helpful. Like on your phone, like press the numbers, press start. So it's like their timer. Mm. So like your timer went off, your five right. minute timer for the bath or whatever. Um, or you, I mean, for bath time, another fun thing you can do is like, you know, do you think you can wash, you know, wash yourself with your eyes closed or something just to make it fun or different. Right. That can kind of speed it up a little bit. Um, races are always good. Right. You oh, know, yeah. like. Mommy's going to beat you. Mommy's going to beat you. Uh, you know, if you have a slow mover, right. get up the stairs, whatever it is. <laughs> yeah. So little I like those like that. tips. Yeah. Now, speaking of screen time, how does screen time affect toddler sleep? It's different for every child. It's really, it's child specific, but generally blue light that comes from our phones, comes from iPads, comes from all screens it suppresses melatonin production. Mm -hmm. And melatonin is what we need to help, that is what makes our body feel sleepy and then go to sleep. So kind of the general rule is to um, stop screens, turn screens off like an hour before bedtime. That's kind of like the general rule. Mm -hmm. But I find that it's it's just different for every, every family. I mean, my kids can watch TV and go right to bed. It's like not an issue. So <laughs> it just depends. I mean, if you if you really are struggling with, with sleep issues, I'd say most of the time when it comes to toddlers, it's much more behavioral in terms of the stalling, the too late of bedtime, the parents' over-involvement. Mm -hmm. That's usually more of the issue mm -hmm. than the screen time. What would you say is your best piece of advice to parents who are struggling because their toddlers resisting sleep training and they're just, the meltdowns are nonstop. Mm -hmm. What do you do to support the parents? I feel like a lot of parents end up finding me or looking for help from someone yes. because they feel desperate. Like, mm -hmm. because like I said before, like we mothers, like we're willing to sacrifice whatever. Right. Parents are willing to do whatever for their kids, right? Yes. So yeah. you know your kid needs to sleep. So you're willing to lay there. You're willing to read 800 books, whatever. <laughs> just please go to sleep, right? <laughs> and so what happens is ultimately parents get to a point where it's not sustainable anymore or the wake-ups are too frequent. It's really negatively affecting their family. Their child's behavior is, you know, in the toilet. They're, they're really seeing the signs of sleep deprivation. Mm -hmm. And they may feel desperate too because, you know, if you have to spend hours laying with your kid, you're not seeing your husband. Right. Like you're not having, you're not catching up on work. Right. You haven't watched a TV show in a year. You know, I mean, you're missing out on me time too. Mm -hmm. But I always tell parents that you really can't focus on, on yourself. You really have to think about the benefit to your child. Because again, if we do it for like, quote unquote, selfish reasons, mm -hmm. we're never going to stick with it. Right. So the best thing to do in that situation is I tell families to write down why they're doing it. 
Like what is so, why is this a bad situation for your family right now? How is it negatively affecting you? How are you seeing these effects on your child? Mm. Because that is what's going to, you know, keep them consistent through, you know, the beginning is usually the hardest part. And so why are we doing this? Why are we really doing this? Like, what is the benefit to your child? You know, we know that sleep helps with cognition, with memory development, with growth. And, and, you know, if you don't get enough sleep, you can have, there's mood disorders and, you know, anxiety and, and all kinds of problems that can come up. So it is an important health concern. So I like to remind parents that it's not just like a nice to have. Mm-hmm maybe one day like right. luxury. <laughs> it's like a thing. We yeah. need, we need our kids to be sleeping. I've heard about separation anxiety, maybe, I don't know, triggering toddlers in their sleep and because they miss someone. Is that also, would you say an interruption when it comes to sleep or are they playing us in this <laughs> moment? Like what, what's happening? Are we being manipulated by the kids? <laughs> Kids are smart. They're very smart. <laughs> Clearly. Kids are smart. Yeah. So I hear this a lot. Like everyone's like, oh, my kid's like such a manipulator. But <laughs> the kid's not, not, that's not, they're not they're like. Not maliciously ex- trying to do that. That's the word yeah. I was looking for. Yeah. They're not being malicious. Yeah. Right? They're, they're not trying to ma- manipulate you. But, but like I said, kids know how to get what they want, you know, and kids have FOMO and kids are attached to us, which is good. I mean, that, that there's, right. you know, we have a healthy attachment to our kids. They like to be with us. That's great. I like to be with them too. Until about 8 p.m. Right. <laughs> <laughs> so so that, that that's a good thing. But we do need to know, we do need to realize that it's still important that our kids go to sleep. So yeah, we need to figure out some ways, some ways to deal with that. But ultimately, you know, our, our kids do need to learn how to go to sleep by themselves. So right. holding those boundaries around our routine, making sure that we have a lot of like loving cuddly, cozy time with them and pointing that out to them. Like, gosh, I love that we got to sit here and snuggle and watch Bluey today. Mm. Wasn't this so fun? All right, now we got to go time to get in our bath. Like really pointing out to them how much you enjoy that time that you spend together and that you are having that time together can help with that. Oh, that is a great really perspective good. Yeah, for sure. So for example, my partner and I, he puts her to, I put her to bed because I have to be the one to do it because she won't want anyone else to put her to bed. Yeah. So when making those routines, should it be one person's de- designated to one thing or should we be switching it up when it's like a two parent household? Yeah, that's a great question. That's really common mm-hmm. where it's like, I only want mom or I only mm-hmm. want dad. Yeah, that's very common. So I say that, you know, y'all are the parents and y'all should be able to decide who puts her to bed Mm -hmm. Um, because every day might be different, right? So I don't like it to be just one person's responsibility. Someone's out of town, someone is at work or what, you know, at dinner or whatever. So it should really be either, either parent, but as you're starting to put a new process in place, if she really like wants you to do it, then maybe that's easier. Like she'll be more open to a new process if you're the one that's doing it. But sometimes the favored parent is like sometimes the softer parent. Mm -hmm. So like maybe it's actually better if the other parent kind of is the one to start because the kid won't maybe get away with as much. Mm -hmm. So it's just kind of a, it's a a family decision on like how to work that. But ultimately, so like I'd say whatever is easy, whoever is going to be easiest for the child to get started with like a new process. To establish the routine. Right. To just to get it established. Mm -hmm. But then the other parent should be able to get worked in. And a good way to do that is for the kid to show you, look how good she's able to go to bed for me. Like, let's show mommy. So then have her show you how good she's been doing at going to bed with dad Mm -hmm. is a way to like let her kind of beef up her confidence. You can be praising her. Wow, I I didn't know you could do all this. You did it so quickly, Mm -hmm. blah, blah, blah. That's great. But I do recommend only one parent at a time does Mm -hmm. bedtime. Okay. At a time, why? Like the whole routine? Like, yeah. Yeah. Interesting, why? Because I just feel like, I mean, each parent is different and each parent has a different relationship with the child. And it's just a lot of energy in the room, right? You're right. It, and that I, makes sense. You can kind of get away with more with dad or with mom or whatever it right. is. And it's just a lot of, it's just a lot of people. Mm-hmm. I think one leader is good. And yeah. Have that one parent. Yeah. For sure. What's the ideal sleep environment for a toddler so that they can get a good night's rest? A co- nice cozy bed, whether it's a, a toddler bed, like a converted crib or, you know, a 
low to the floor bed or a twin bed or, or whatever it is. But I'd say, you know, make it cozy. If they're recently out of a crib and you have to put them in um, a bed that's high off the floor or even like a queen bed or something, add some pillows, add a million stuffed animals or something to make it feel a little bit smaller. Use some bed rails to make it feel comfortable. Mm -hmm. um, that's a good thing to do. But general rules are dark, the darker, the better. So like blackout curtains are good, especially if you've got, you know, early wakers and it's the summer, mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. that can help. If kids like some light, if they feel like they're scared of the dark, then using um, like a dim nightlight is fine or even like a salt lamp, mm -hmm. um, which has like a, like kind of an orangish glow and they usually have dimmer. So like a dim, dim light, um, cool temperature. They say 68 degrees is actually the best for sleep, which is a little Ooh, cool, but wow. yeah, that's kind of the general, general rule. Oh, that's. And white noise. I said white noise already, but yeah, white noise. Katrina, do you use white noise with Amara? We would, uh, we did in the beginning and then we pivoted to kind of soft music. Mm -hmm. But again, it doesn't really work that well because it'll be something <laughs> that she'll hear and she'll be like, oh, or it'll stop because yeah. the pattern and it'll change. And then she'll like notice yeah. something changed. So it breaks her out of whatever trance she might have been in <laughs> at any point and she'll wake up. So yeah. then how do you measure success like what share what, us yeah. share the what success your, stories what or what are your steps like oh this means it takes two weeks and then that's so yeah so the the way that i've designed my course is it takes two weeks kind of it, it takes it's designed to take two weeks a lot of times it can take a lot less time than that mm -hmm. so it really just depends on the family and how quickly you want to progress but really two weeks or less is, is what it should take once you have a plan a real plan and are actually committed to it. Mm -hmm. But success can look, I mean, I've helped families go from, you know, people who've been co-sleeping for six years to having a kid who sleeps independently. And the parents wow. are like, oh my God, like I have so much time at night. Like I am bored. Like what do people do? Ooh. What am I supposed to do from eight till 11 o'clock every night? You know, now that my kid is in bed, like that's a huge success story. That yeah. Is I mean, this is what happens because parents, it's really just kind of, usually it becomes a slippery slope. Like parents will, you know, stay in their kid's room for a few nights. Mm -hmm. Then all of a sudden a year goes by and you're like, what is happening? Like right. now I have to stay in their room and then they're coming into my room at two in the morning. Now I don't have any time with my husband. I don't have my own room anymore because my right. kid thinks it's their room. <laughs> so yeah, but success can, st I mean, it can start small. Like, and it usually does. So mm -hmm. as you're starting the process, I tell people to keep, like you have to keep a sleep log. Like you have to write down what oh. you're doing and, and, you know, so you can see baby steps. Mm -hmm. So like, let's say your kid's waking up four times a night right. and then your kid is waking up three times a night. That still sucks, but it's progress. <laughs> right. So then it'll go down wow. to two and one from there. So what happens when a toddler is waking up in the middle of the night? Like for Katrina, let's say she's able to get Amara down and she's self-soothing and she's able to put herself to sleep, but then she wakes up in the middle of the night wanting Katrina. What does Katrina do at 2 a.m. or yeah. 3 a.m. when yeah. this happens? So the good thing is once you get her to the point where you're not laying with her at bedtime and she's falling asleep by herself, those middle of the night wake ups will stop. Oh, because she won't need you anymore. Cause that's what she's waking oh. up. Well, sorry. That's, that sounded awful. <laughs> no, <I'm just> <laughs> then you're done. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Your job as a, as a mother is over. No, she won't need you in order to fall asleep anymore. Right. So she's not going to wake up because, because she's going to be in her room. She's going to have her pillow and her blankie and her lovey and her sound machine. And she's going to be cozy. She's going to fall asleep by herself. So nothing's going to wake her up. She's not missing anything in the middle of the night anymore. Oh. So just that going to sleep independently will help with that. Mm -hmm. But let's say she does wake up. So then you have to look at like mm -hmm. what's happening at that time. Cause there are some kids that fall asleep independently, but then have night wake ups. And usually what's happening is they're getting some like benefit of the wake up, right? Whether it's then the parent pulls them into their bed because the parents are tired and it's 2 a.m. or whatever, or the parent will then go and sleep with them. So you've got to look at your kid's behavior and your response to their behavior mm -hmm. because like, you know, we can't control other people. Right. And unfortunately that also applies to our own children. <laughs> <laughs> what ab what about night terrors? I've heard about night terrors. I don't know really what they are. Is it a thing that we should be concerned about when babies are now toddlers? 
Yeah, so night terrors typically start in the toddler years if they're gonna happen. And they don't happen to everybody. I think it's, I wanna say it's like three or 5%. It's it's not it's not a, a lot of people oh, that it happens okay. to. Now, a lot of people might think they're seeing a night terror, but I'll tell you what it actually is. So a night terror is a sleep disturbance that happens in the first few hours of sleep. So before midnight is typically when you see them. I have personal experience. My older daughter had night terrors for a while. She went through a phase and she's also a sleepwalker. So that's nice and freaky. Oh. But but night terrors are are scary mostly for the parents because it it look it it looks like your child needs like an exorcism. I mean, mm -hmm. the child will wake up from being dead asleep and be yelling, crying. They might be saying no or stop. So it sounds like something really traumatic is going on. They may be thrashing around or my daughter would get up and be walking around her room mm -hmm. um, and it will go on and then it will stop. If you try to go into the room, they won't even know that you're there. Like they are asleep the whole time. So they're not saying mommy, mommy, mommy. And then when you come in, they feel better. It's not like that. It's like they're going through something and you are not able to help them. They're asleep. They're fine. They don't remember it in the morning. So if wow. it's a true night terror, you're just supposed to go in there, make sure that they're safe. So my daughter, I'd like make sure she wasn't going to knock over a picture frame or anything. Um, and then just make sure that she falls asleep back in her bed. But like she's asleep. Wow. No memory Whoa. of it. And I'm like traumatized. Of course. <laughs> but a true night terror doesn't need anything from the from the parent. Mm -hmm. And a true night terror, the child is not going to be relieved. It's not like they'll only, you know, go to sleep if they're in your bed or something. Mm -hmm. That's not a night terror. That's just a kid having a temper tantrum in the middle of the night. How long do night terrors last for? Yeah. I mean, I would say it could last for a few minutes in the moment, but it could go on for a few years. Wow. And it's not going to be every night. It's not something that happens every night. Got it. Got it. Got it. If it does happen every night, I would talk to your pediatrician. There, There is some, you can go in if, if you know kind of what time it's going to happen. Usually my daughter, it was like 1030. You can go in and kind of like roll them over before that to kind of like disrupt their sleep cycle a little bit. But in most cases, it's not that, it's not that serious of a problem. Wow. wow. It's just strange. It's just a strange phenomenon. Wow. It's crazy how much we don't even like know about sleep. I just think it's so intriguing. Like there's just such oh, a mystery. Yeah. Oh, for sure. So for parents who are about to have a second child, what do they do when their toddler finds out and is completely having a meltdown? Because like, who's this new thing person here taking <laughs> my, my parents, yeah, my <laughs> parents, my place, right? What happens at that point? How does sleep training still play a part? What do you do in that situation? And that that is, I mean, that is a real thing. And so you'll really? see. Really? Yeah, it's a real thing. I mean, kids, it's it's a big life change. It's a big life change oh, for, for sure. everybody in the family. Right. And, um, you know, you can expect for your older kid to kind of regress in any number of ways. I mean, you could see that with all of a sudden starting to have accidents again if they were already potty trained or mm, all of a wow. sudden picky eating kind of like spikes you might see some behavior things. It's really just all, it's, it's what you said. I mean, every like so many things have changed that it's your kid just fighting for some control over whatever they possibly can control. And so, yeah, you might see it as, uh, affect sleep also. But the most important thing that you can do, I tell parents, and I've got a lot of parents who kind of start the toddler sleep training process when they're pregnant because they're looking ahead like, okay, how am I going to... How am I going to deal with this? I've right. got my three-year-old who's up twice a night and I'm going to have this newborn baby. So really work to get the toddler sleeping well before you have the baby. And then the best thing that you can do for your older kid across the board when you bring home a new baby is make them know that the, although a lot of things are different, a lot of things are still the same. Like they still go to their school. They still have their same schedule because kids, they do thrive on that schedule and that routine. So keeping that as status quo as you can is important. And that goes for the bedtime routine too. You know, we still do the same things, you know, it's good to, if you can give them a bedtime routine, just one, one-on-one -on -one time, that's mm -hmm. a good time to have that special time with them. When you've worked with families and you're preparing them, you know, to get their toddler on a schedule and try to get some good sleep, what would you say has been the hardest thing for parents to grasp? You know, when you're talking to them, you're like, look, I need you to do X, Y, Z. In order for this to be successful, in order for your toddler to get yeah. some good sleep, I need you to do these things. What's the one thing that just seems to be extremely difficult for parents? Moving bedtime 
earlier is a real challenge for a lot of families, you know, especially two families where there's two working, <laughs> working parents. And it's That's like, right. you know, how am I supposed to get my kid to bed at seven 30 when we don't get home until six, you right. know, that seems like we're not going to have enough time together. Um, so I think that that's, that's a hard thing. Um, and then, I mean, there's definitely, you know, things that you can do, um, to ease that. But then another thing I think is just learning to hold boundaries. You know, mm -hmm. a lot of parents struggle with that because we, you know, we don't yes. ever want to see our kids be in distress. Like we just want to fix it for them and make it stop. You yeah. know I mean? That's just mm -hmm. the natural Absolutely reaction. Um, and so holding boundaries can, can be tough. And a lot of times, um, sleep training may be one of the first times where you're really having to learn how to do that. Yeah. It sounds like we have a lot of work. I got a lot of work and, but I'm, I'm ready. I'm going to make the, um, go over the schedule with her, right. Kind of help her, have her help me make it. Then I'm excited to draw. <laughs> yeah. Draw it out for her. <laughs> have just, her color it and put stickers yeah, on she's it. She's really, make it her own. I, she's, we have great communication. She's like, you know, she's able to kind of express what she likes, what she doesn't like. So I think a lot of the tips you gave, I think it'll be helpful. The one parent at bedtime, that's, we're going to work on that. Cause you know what? He gives her a bath and then I take over and do the bedtime thing. So actually I don't count bath as part of like the okay. official bedtime routine. Oh, like, oh man, interesting. I'm going to have to do the whole yeah. thing. <laughs> Well, because okay. because sometimes people don't do baths every night, yeah. or they may not do them in the evening or whatever. So, um, yeah, I don't count. I count when I say bedtime routine. I'm thinking like what happens the last like fifteen minutes in their room. Okay, cool. Okay, cool. So he'll Ooh. still give her a bath because he's good at that. Yeah, yeah. And don't, I take don't take her that off. Oh, yeah, <laughs> if you've like, gotten oh, off I your plate, have to do the bath and put her to bed. <laughs> oh man. <laughs> now, Katrina, I know you had brought up about the breastfeeding and any yes. questions. And so how I, I am still nursing my daughter. Yep. Right. Um, that's a whole nother thing. I'm trying to get her to kind of start weaning off. Mm -hmm. um, but it, I think that's impacted our sleeping as well. Yep. Any tips that with that on how to kind of help her get to a point where she doesn't need me to do that with her yeah. every night to get her to bed. <laughs> yep, yep, totally. So I say the best thing to do when you're working in a situation like that mm -hmm. is, so like I mentioned earlier, I, like you need to start thinking with her that like food is for, you know, the daytime. Mm -hmm. We eat during mm -hmm. the day mm -hmm. and then at night we go to sleep and, and they need more of a separation, mm -hmm. right, at this point. And so- Think about feeding her, like do it in a well lit room. Like don't do it like in the rocker in her room where she's kind of falling asleep. So one like easy, really super gentle way to do that would be if you feel like she still needs to nurse at night or she's used to doing that, do that in a well lit room where she's not falling asleep. Kind of keep her awake, get through the process. Mm -hmm. Then you can go into her room and you could still rock her to sleep, but just mm -hmm. don't nurse her. That will help kind of just start that separation. Right between the two. Okay. Yeah, no, that makes sense. We have so many different kind of mountains to climb right now that yeah. we're trying to figure which mountain do we want to climb first. So potty training is like the last thing on our mind right now. We're like, <laughs> yeah. let's get the bed thing right. Let's get the breast we breastfeeding weaning going. Yeah. So. Yeah, I tell a lot of families, because um, I feel like a lot of kids still will take even like a sippy cup of milk if they're not nursing. Like they'll, you know, use that to go to bed. Okay. And I, you know, have that milk if you want it in the kitchen. Mm -hmm. And then we say Makes night, sense. night, yeah. night, night kitchen, night, night refrigerator, night, night milk, like however, right. <laughs> whatever you need to do, say night, night to all the things. And like, meaning we'll see you in the morning. Like yeah. we're done with you for the that day. Totally makes sense. Yeah. And I feel like it's not abrasive yeah. for Amar to hear that. I feel yeah. like it's like a nice way to, this chapter's closed for tonight and we'll yeah. open it up in the uh -huh. morning. Yeah. See you in the morning. He's very amenable to all like the creative ways to, get our imagination going like, okay, say goodnight to the fridge. We're going to go. Right. Yeah. Like, right, yeah. I use that with the potty a lot. Yeah. Say night, blow kisses to the potty. Yeah. That's great. Love you potty. We'll see you tomorrow. <laughs> when families are desperate and looking for help and they come to you and they need your help and guidance, what's the best piece of advice that you give them to make sure that they're ready? Like what's their homework that you kind of prepare them with? And you're like, well, if you want to start this, I'm going to need you to commit to this. Yeah. Okay. So that's a good question. So most people find me and I send them to, I have a free class that I send parents to. And um, 
what that free class does is it really, it, it gives people mm. an idea of my teaching style. Like you're going to learn some things about the schedule. You're going to learn some things about bedtime. Um, you're going to really learn why you're in the situation about how, um, like we mentioned, like how your kids, be, your kids behave in one way and then you react to their behavior. So it's both of y'all are in this dance. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And so um, it really gives you kind of a good introduction into like my teaching style and then my rest method. So I tell families to to take this free class, which gives them a really good high level kind of understanding. So then they they really know what they're getting into. They know that they're going to need to make changes to the schedule, to the bedtime, and that sleep independence is at bedtime is the heart of the changes that they're going to need to make. And, and so, that consistency is key. <laughs> right. So once you send them that free kind of routine and what they can expect, and if they're like, okay, I can commit, then is that when it begins and how? So then if they enroll in my course, right. yeah, then they would enroll in my course. And then that's when at the beginning of the course is where I talk about the science behind sleep and why it's so important for our kids to be getting sleep and how you got to focus on your kid and not on the benefits to you as the parent, right. like we were saying. And that's where I have people write down like why they're doing this. Um, but it's, you know, I tell people it's best to start this process when you have a couple weeks to dedicate to it, where you don't have late night events, you don't have travel, you're not going to a different time zone. Like mm -hmm. y'all are going to be home and you're going to be sticking to it. You're going to stick to your early bedtime and you know that it might be tough in the beginning, but you're going to get through it. And it's, it's a process with a beginning and an end. I think that's important for parents to know too. Yes. It doesn't go on forever. Like right. if you follow the plan, it's only going to take <laughs> two weeks. So you got to give me that two weeks time and then you have, and then you'll have things set up. For the families that you've helped, how, I want to hear how they've thanked you. I'm sure some families were like, thank you for saving my life and my sanity. <laughs> I know you're humble, but I, we need to hear it. We need to know that there is hope. We need to hear the stories of success so we can continue to believe. <laughs> I love it. I think the best compliments that I get are when people tell me that they can see the difference in their kids. Mm. You know? What kind of differences? Like they'll hear from their pre the preschool teachers will like call them and be like, oh my gosh, he's listening so much better. He's sharing like everything. Like you can just see, someone told me that the child it was behind in like their speech development. So, and my program has a lot of like communication like with your children. And so I really say, as long as your child is a good communicator, it's a good fit for you. Mm -hmm. But they, the parent was saying, well, they're kind of behind in their speech and, you know, we're going to give it a try. And then they came back and said, oh my God, his language has exploded since he's mm. been sleeping. Cause the kid was, the kid was, I think in the bed for maybe 10 hours, but like, you know, up and down and I say playing musical beds all over mm -hmm. the place. And so really not getting a lot of sleep. So that's the best compliment. And then the other thing I love to hear is when people tell me that this process was better than like marriage counseling. Wow. <laughs> because that's something that people don't talk about. Because like if your kid isn't sleeping and you and your partner aren't on the same page, right. or if you and your partner have different ideas and you both are, you know, strong willed mm -hmm. people, then mm -hmm. you're butting heads, right? You're arguing. And then maybe you're not seeing each other at night because one of you sleeping with your kid. I mean, it, it can, it can really cause dis disturbances in marriages. So I love, I love bringing, you know, couples back together again too, because they can have, a, they have a shared plan. They're like, okay, we just do what she said. Yeah. <laughs> it's easier. And I think it's easier in that situation because you are an expert, right. I, an actual certified expert, right? right? So I just think, you know, especially first time parents, we don't know what we're doing. Right. So we're all trying to figure it out. We all think we might have the answer because of an Instagram post and we don't know who we're following. <laughs> right. So I think it's easier to get couples on the same page when it's a plan from you. That's yes. because you're a real just expert. You're a certified real trainer. So it's yeah. really different. You have the science to back it up. You have the real methods that work. Yep. I feel like all parents should have this. Yeah. Like it's just Absolutely. Like, well, and that's the wonderful thing I feel like about Instagram and about the internet is like, as parents, especially as mothers, well, I guess as fathers too, but like, or it's asking for help isn't natural. Right. I mean, we all want to act like we know what we're doing. And yeah, like, oh, I read this Instagram post, like I've got all the answers. Now. Right. right. <laughs> but, right. but there are so many resources for parents. And, you know, I've been doing this for eight years. So although I only have two kids and like you only have one kid, right. I've helped 
thousands of kids. So I've just wow, seen great. all of these situations in varying levels. You know, some people will come to me and say, oh, this is so embarrassing. And then they'll tell me like, just like a story that's not even that bad. I'll be like, well, you should have heard what somebody else told me. Like, you don't even know what's happening. There's some crazy things happening in people's houses. So I've seen it all. So like I bring all of that to my families. And your sessions are virtual? Yeah. Okay, that's great. Yeah. Which I think is so great. Yeah. Because who has the time to go anywhere and meet up? I mean, we could barely figure this out and trying to get <laughs> the house. we're here together. <laughs> yeah. So, okay. So tell us more about the sessions. Like what do parents take away. Yeah. So it's a, it's a totally online digital program that is like a go at your own pace program. So when you enroll in mm, it, I love that. you get access to everything all at one time. Mm -hmm. So it's a total of about two hours of content, but it's all broken up. So like I said, it's R E S T. So there's all these different modules with lessons in there. So it's five minutes here, eight minutes there. So it's very easy to get through. So after you watch that, it's kind of like a choose your own adventure. Mm. So you're going to learn things about your kid and you're going to print out the little like, handout that comes with it. And you're going to kind of write down, you know, based on your kid's age, your kid's sleepy cues, what's the bedtime for you. You're going to learn different strategies. Um, you know, if you're a co coming out of a co-sleeping situation or if, you know, depending on what situation you're in, I give you guidance as to which different strategies would work for you. So there's choices and ways to customize for every parenting style. I love it's this. Great. Yeah. So it's very, very, very customizable. So at the end of at the end of going through the actual watching the videos, you have your plan. Okay. So that's when you get started with your kid. That's where you have the meeting that I mentioned, where you do mm. the bedtime exercise, where you start doing some new things to encourage that sleep independence. And then that's when the two weeks begins. So then you you go through it each night. Like you know what to do night one, two, three, like every single night. And it's all the what ifs. What if they do this? What if this happens, you know? So it's all covered. And then we have a, a private Facebook community mm -hmm. and that's where families can go if they have, you know, any questions or something doesn't seem to be working or they have a unique situation. And then we, you know, we get back to them very quickly and, and help wow. them. Wow, okay, so yeah. do you have check-ins with parents or how does this work so that you know, okay, the plan that they're following is actually working for them? Um, so we don't have check-ins. So we have that. We have the private community where they can Got go it. and ask questions. And then, you know, it, we can start a, a, a string. So they ask a question, we Correct. reply. Okay. And they're like, okay, it's been three nights. X, Y, Z happened. So if people want to do that, then we can certainly do that. Um, they can always add on calls with me. So I do Zoom calls with families um, that they can, yeah, that's an additional thing they can add on. But yeah, so I talk to families that way all the time. And then wow. within the community. Can you just tell us why sleep training or just like a sleep coach, the benefits of a toddler getting a good night's rest. Like, I, I think I want to just focus on the benefits in that because I, I feel like we didn't, you know, and you have all this science. Why is it important for kids to get good sleep? Like, how does that impact their whole life? Yeah. I mean, there, there is research to show that, you know, kids who don't get enough sleep when they're younger, that can actually impact their learning in elementary school. Ooh, so they've okay. they've actually tracked kids from from, you know, when they're very young all the way through elementary school. I think they say that 25% of kids under the age of 5 don't get enough sleep. And so it's 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 a serious problem. So 10 to 12 hours of consistent sleep, meaning they go to sleep and you don't see them for 10 to 12 hours. That's that's the goal for kids of this age. But certainly I think behavioral problems is the one thing that we that parents can see. That's, that's the way I think you see it most. But also like there's things that we don't see that happen when we sleep, right? When we sleep is the only time that we release growth hormones. Like that's mm, actually when we yeah. are growing. When we sleep, that's when memories are formed and consolidated. So our experiences and things that we learned, whether it's like wow. learning the alphabet or whatever, or just learning about our friends and mm -hmm. our family, like those memories are consolidated when we sleep. So all of those processes are disrupted when we're not getting that. And that impacts them. So I think it's important, you know, for parents, like, I don't know. I just feel like that isn't something that's really talked about. Right. I don't. Right. And, and as parents, it's like, when you hear that, you're like, oh, I need to make sure right. yep. that my child is getting the sleep that they need. And if I don't know how to do it, I need to come and, you know, book a session yeah, or just right. do whatever you have to do, yeah. get some help and go to a certified toddler sleep coach, you 
because you actually are experienced in this. Yeah. And certified. I can't emphasize that enough. Yes. Because I have fallen for so many fake experts on Instagram. <laughs> oh my <laughs> gosh. Well, fake experts on Instagram for sure too. Right. And then this is not like meant to be a dig in any way, but like your pediatrician does not have that much education in sleep. Absolutely. <laughs> I don't know if you've noticed that, Katrina. Well, what do you mean? Pediatricians don't really know the sleep training or just yeah. like understanding the the concept of like, right. okay, sleep and they know it's important. Oh yeah. They know the science behind right. it, yes. but they're not going to give you the routine, the coaching. Uh, oh yes. yeah. So oh, yeah. you need. They, yeah. They know everything medical. So like right. if, you, yes. if there is something medically wrong with your child that is affecting their sleep, they will be able to identify that and point you in the right direction. There mm. are sleep doctors that deal mm. with medical problems. Yes. I see. Right. right. But, yes. but what, what we're talking about here are behavioral problems, uh -huh. healthy yes. kids, not behavioral problems isn't, isn't the right word, but, Beh right. a behavioral situation that the parent and the child over the course of time have developed right. that right. has become an issue. Right. So that's what your pediatrician isn't going to be able to give you the specific coaching on, right? right? They'll, they might say like, well, you know, if you're sleeping with them, you know, at bed, if you're falling asleep with them at bedtime, then they're going to keep waking up. So stop doing that. Right. That's what they I, might tell you that. I've gotten they, that. Yeah. They, yeah, they might. That. And I feel okay. like that's a good thing at least, yeah. but I think there's- But then how? But how? Right, right. We need the how. And that's right. why I think the conversation Absolutely. with Jessica is amazing and the services that you provide and you're an actual certified taller sleep coach. I just feel it's so beneficial. And I feel like parents wish they knew about- sleep coaches in oh, general, man. like yeah. what, this exists? Yeah, Someone is going to help me, you know, have my house less chaotic. Right. <laughs> and we're gonna have, you know, it's not it's not gonna be perfect, but we can get on a routine. There's yes. expectations and- Yeah, when you're gonna have time at night. I mean, that's the other thing people tell me. It's like, I, li I mean, I literally have hours in my day. I mean, right. I have that's hours crazy. in my day. That's amazing. Oh man. It's like literally created more time in your life. You know what? The holidays come up. Forget gifts and lavish presents. <laughs> yes. Just get the services yes. from Jessica. Great Valentine's Day gift. Absolutely. Oh, because great. that is the present parents need a good night's sleep. So you want to get a good night's sleep, get the routine, get yeah. the coaching that you need yep. so that you don't lose your mind. So how do yep. they, how do they find you? <laughs> so, okay. Well, um, I mentioned the free class that I send people to. So I think that's a great place to get started and really like understand this at a deeper level. Mm -hmm. So um, it's a free class, but you have to save your spot and people can do that at toddlersleepmasterclass.com. I'm obsessed with Love this it. name. <laughs> Love so, it. Toddlersleepmasterclass.com. You can go there and you can pick a time that works for you, save your spot. If something comes up, life, kids, you know, right. I'll send you a replay. Don't worry about it. So that's a good, a good resource. And then um, my Instagram, I'm really active on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a good place to get some, get some tips and learn about me too. So at awesome little sleepers is my, is my name. Great that's tips. how we found you. Great tips, yes. by the way. And that's how we found you on Instagram. But this we is love certified, that you're certified. 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 <laughs> Please understand Not this. Not just a random <laughs> yeah. Instagram person. Right. Yes. Yeah. So, and you have great tips. Thank you. Great, great tips. Great thank stuff. you. Thank you. And, and I think for someone who, who might be hesitant, doesn't doesn't know, okay, what is a certified toddler sleep mm -hmm. coach? Like, go look at the tips, go look at the work that yep. Jessica does, mm -hmm. and that will help you understand mm -hmm. the work that you do and why it's so important. Yep. Yep. Yay. Thank you so thank much thank for you. being so much here for today. We thank really appreciate yes. it. Let's check in on Katrina in a couple of months. Let's do yes. it. Let's do it. Let's see how she's doing. <laughs> Let's do it for but sure. But Jessica, thank you so much. And anytime you have anything going on or, you know, you're doing new courses or anything, let us know so we can still support long past this interview. So thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you. Of I really course. appreciate that. Absolutely. This was great. This Yay. was great. I loved it. Thank you. Thank you. Oh, I'm awesome. about to get my four hours back.